Matthew chapter 6. You can flip right on over there. Uh, that's going to be where we kind of spend most of our time. We're going to spend our time actually looking through the last book today. But where we're, our base text for today is Matthew 6, 1 through 4. So, for quite some time, as a church, we have been studying Jesus' teaching to his followers in the Sermon on the Mount. And if I was to summarize the entire Sermon on the Mount in maybe one question, how I would summarize that, it would be, what does God really want? Think about that with me for just a second. What is it that God really wants? Hopefully at this point, seeing how we've kind of gotten through about half of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, hopefully... At this point, the answer is starting to become pretty clear, or maybe it already is quite clear. Our Heavenly Father wants our hearts. That's what He's after. He wants our hearts. The scribes and Pharisees, they were all about the external. Outwardly appearing to be super spiritual. That's what they were about. But inwardly, their motivation it was really me-centered. That was really what it was. Outward behavior that looked great, but inward it was not. They craved the attention and admiration and approval of others. They were very self-righteous. If what we seek is the shine of the spotlight, then our Savior isn't center stage. What we've done at that point is we have removed him from his proper place. we put something else where only God belongs. And we are no longer glorifying him like we should. We are actually glorifying ourselves. So as we unfold Jesus' teaching on giving, praying, and fasting, the temptation is to make it all about external behavior. All of us, we must ask ourselves, who gets glory from my giving, from my praying, from my fasting? Is it me, or is it God? Who's really getting the glory from that? So, let's read Matthew 6, 1 through 4. It says this, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men, to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. i got to be honest with you. Messages on the topic of giving, that can be a little bit tricky. Okay? It hits a little close to home to a lot of us. Giving in itself is a very sensitive subject because it is so personal and it is so private. Verse 2 of what I just read, it highlights and it really starts off with the statement, so when you give. That means giving is assumed. It's not an optional thing. All of us are supposed to be regularly giving to God. One of the reasons why I believe giving is such a sensitive subject is because ultimately we are trying to live life in our own strength. We have fallen victim to human logic and reason. We look at things, and I know I'm guilty of this at times, I look at things on a very practical level. Bills and monthly expenses, they are always breathing down our neck. And it feels like sometimes maybe we are living actually paycheck to paycheck. Has anybody ever experienced that or felt that? <laughs> yeah. 
So that pressure squarely on our shoulders, giving. You think about giving. I would give if I honestly had more. I would give if honestly I had any left over at the end of that. That's sometimes how our mind works. Like everything else, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching. He flips the script. And he adjusts our thinking. He, he's doing a radical overhaul at this point. Jesus, he draws our mind back to our motivation. He comes back to what's really in our hearts when it comes to the topic of giving. Our giving to God is directly related to our gratitude to God. Think about that. God has been so good to us. He really has. When you stop and ponder for just a minute how God has been good to us. Our giving to God it is a way to reciprocate back to God. It is a way for us to just simply say thank you to God for all that he has done on our behalf. I do want to share an interesting thought. Interesting thought. God does not need our giving. He doesn't. And I have to be honest with you. Sometimes I think we as a church, and I use that as like universal church, sometimes we really have missed the mark, at least in the way that we display this to other people. Okay? I know of churches, and I believe they probably have a good motive behind it, but they're like, let's do a big sale. We really need to raise money. It's like God can't do this in his own. Do you really believe that God owns a cattle on a thousand hills? Does he really need us? He owns your bank account already. <laughs> I think about that. Everything belongs to our God. We are just stewards. We're really caretakers of what God has already entrusted into our hands. And the question is, what are we going to do with what God has blessed? What God does is he simply allows us to be a part of what he's doing. And it's such a blessing to be able to be a part of that. I think sometimes our fear of the unknown or our financial concerns, they can hinder and or impede our participation and what God's doing. Before we begin, I want to ask us one more really tough question. This question is actually today's sermon title. Here it is. What does my giving reveal? Let's ask ourselves that. What does my giving reveal? Before we look at it, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <coughs> Lord, um, we come before you, and, and we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you are all-powerful. We thank you for all the resources that you do have. And Lord, we thank you that what you have entrusted to us, you allow us to participate. You allow us to, to be a blessing and an encouragement to other people. Lord, you use these little trinkets. That's really all they are. They're a drop in the bucket to what you already own. But Lord, you use those. And in some way, Lord, you use them in mighty, mighty ways. And so God, I pray, Lord, as we look at this and we evaluate today's text and just the idea of giving, Lord, I pray that you would Speak to our hearts, or that you would minister through what you have entrusted to us, whether it's finances, whether it's our time, whether it's the abilities and the gifts that you have so richly blessed us with. May we not be stingy. May we not be misers. May we not hoard these for ourselves. Lord, may we also not go to the other end of the spectrum where we exalt ourselves where we make it about a show, or use us, or we just humbly want to be used by you. 
And so we come before you and we ask you to use your word and speak to us through it. We love you and we pray in your name. Amen. Matthew 6, 1. It starts off and it says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. In regards to giving, we need to be watchful. Uh, we need to be guarded over not making our giving all about a show. Uh, it is a matter of the heart. That is where our giving is to come from. If our purpose in giving is for other people to applaud us, then what this passage is really driving home is then all of that, we've had all of our reward already. You, you don't really get to get the double dip. Okay? You're not going to be applauded and, and blessed here and, and rewarded here on earth. If that's what we're seeking, we've received it in full. Again, the question that Jesus is driving home is it comes down to what's our motivation in giving? Who is really getting glory? Is it God or is it me? Verse 2 of Matthew 6. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Originally, when I read this, and maybe even when I still read this, I think the picture that comes to my mind is almost like this big cartoonish parade. Where this person comes on in, and there's this grand procession that kind of leads him into the building. And maybe he's coming on in, and he's got like carriages, and he's got maybe these big bags of money, and he's walking on in. And he's going to go make his donation. And all the trumpets are sounding around him, and it's like, doo -doo -doo, here he comes. The good guy's coming to give. I don't know. But he gets there, and he makes this huge spectacle. I have to imagine... I don't think that really that type of exaggerated image is too far off base for what is being shared. But when I dug into this and I looked historically speaking, I'm not entirely sure that exactly matches. Again, I read this before, but I want to read what this one commentator, this historian, how he put this practice. He said, in the temple court during the first century, there were 13 collection boxes for alms. Okay, that's given. They were wide at the base and narrow at the top and resembled trumpets. These boxes made a very recognizable sound as the coins were dropped into them. Often, those Pharisees who wished to boast would drop a large number of coins in at once. This was called sounding the trumpet. It was this practice of letting everyone know how much they were giving that Jesus opposed. So both of these, whether it's that cartoonish image that you've got, or even in, in history, how it really played out, both of those things, it comes back to what is in the heart. Why are you giving? Giving to God, it had become a spectacle. It was for the attention and applause and admiration of man, not God. And Jesus is saying, if that's your motivation, know that God is not impressed. It does not wow God in the slightest. God won't reward you. That type of giving is a vain exercise. It's pointless. If our hearts are wrong in our giving, then no matter the sum of money that we give, God won't reward that. You've got to ask yourself, what does my giving reveal? Now, I do have to say, I'll put a little pin on that. Even if you have a wrong motive in giving, that does not reduce God to being unable to use what you have given. Okay? I do want to say that. But Matthew 6, uh, 3 through 4, it says, But when you give to the poor, 
Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Literally, this passage, it opens up and it says, You, however, doing acts of charity. That's literally what that is um, that's tr translated to. This speaks to someone presently involved in giving. It is an ongoing, present act that is taking place. And I have to say, it is broader than just giving financial assistance. It also includes giving our time. It includes our abilities. It includes other resources that the Lord has given and entrusted to us. So I want us to think about this. What did God give us? I think in order for us to really understand the heart behind giving, we have to see first what God has given to us. Perhaps a familiar passage to you, John 3, 16 to 18. This is what it says. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him, sorry, no, John 3, 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. First thing we need to see is that God gave Jesus. He gave his only begotten Son. Romans 8.32 he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for all things, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Sometimes I believe we are so worried about our daily responsibilities that we forget our Heavenly Father has a vested interest in us. God gave of himself, and he did that to purchase the bounty that was on our heads because of sin. That's marvelous. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Do you realize that God willingly gave of himself? God willingly gave His Son, Jesus, God in the flesh, to take our punishment and to take our penalty that our sin caused. That reality is unbelievable. That reality, it should shake us to the core. It should bring us to a place where we are driven to our knees in appreciation. In sheer gratitude, we cry out, thanks be to God. Flip over with me to 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. I really love this. 1 John 3, right at the end of the New Testament, he says in 1 through 3, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. That word bestowed, some translations, I like them better when it says lavish. That's really what this word is. It says, see how great a love the Father has lavished on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, 
because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. God has given. God, he has lavished his love on us. You realize through faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ that we are God's children. He calls us children. We have been adopted and engrafted into the family of God because of his finished work on Calvary. Because of that, as we've looked in Ephesians chapter 1, we are holy and blameless. He does not see us as filthy, rotten sinners that really by nature we are. God sees us as forgiven. He sees us as redeemed. He sees us as people who are now joint heirs with Jesus. He sees us as people who are incredibly loved. In James 1, 16 to 17, it says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God has given us His Son, and God, He is such a good, good Father. He also continues to bless us. He doesn't stop lavishing His love on us. Everything good, it comes from God. Our God, He is so good that He is able to take even our past mistakes and He is able to use them for our present good. Our God, He is so good that even the sin that other people have committed against us, our good Heavenly Father is able to use those sins as well for our present good. That's phenomenal news. He is not limited by our choice of rebellion or even other people's choice of rebellion. What a good Father, we have. You want to talk about a good and gracious and loving Heavenly Father. All of our giving, it has to start from that knowledge. It's from that place that we give back to God. It is from hearts that are overflowing with gratitude that we give to God. It is this place that we give to God first and before anything else, we say, Lord, it's all yours, and we just want to give back to you. Now, I say all of that. From a worldly standpoint, that logically does not make sense. Okay? The world looks at that and they go, that's foolishness. You've got responsibilities. You've got bills. You've got things you need to pay for. You've got other things that are top priority other than God. And let me tell you, that is not true. God is first and foremost, and He always is first and foremost. Matthew. A little bit later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this in Matthew 6. Flip over there with me. Matthew 6, 25 to 34. He says this. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. 
They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. This is key. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Seek to follow God. Seek to serve Him. Seek to glorify Him first and foremost. Then, when our primary concern is consumed by that, when that is our primary focus, our Heavenly Father, He has a way of working out all of our physical needs. But it really comes down to, will we trust Him? Will we honestly surrender and trust Him? The question that was kind of going through my head as I was preparing this is, how will others know we are children of God? And it says this in John 13. 34 to 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now this type of love that is being shared, it is a selfless love. Selfless love, it is really giving of ourselves. It is esteeming someone else as better than yourself. It is looking out for their best interest above your own. It's sacrificially loving. That also is giving of ourselves. Even if that means that our comfort is rocked, I'm still going to give of myself. This type of love, it is unconditional love, which is a giving of ourselves with no expectations. It's not based on what you'll do for me. I want us to think about the widow's money. Flip over to Mark 12. I told you we'd be all over the place today. Mark 12. It also talks about it in Luke, but we're going to read Mark 12, 41 to 44. And he, Jesus, sat down opposite the treasure. Okay, I can only imagine this. He's sitting there, he's stationed, he's watching what is about to take place. And began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which amount to a son. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they all put in out of their surplus. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she owned, all she had, this poor widow, she didn't have much, but what she had, she happily gave to her Heavenly Father. I have to think about what unfolded that day. It was this radical life lesson that was being taught to the disciples who got a chance to see it. No one else probably batted an eye at the widow's gift. It was probably like, oh, okay, great, thanks. Move on, next. Let's get to the big donors. But God, 
Think about that. God, He knows the heart. He knows exactly what that value was to that poor widow. He knew all that she gave and what that really meant to her. Back to our text, Matthew 6, 3 through 4. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What you give should be a private matter between you and God Almighty. The rest of the body does not need to know about your giving. That is not something that needs to be publicized. We don't want to do that. If others, they end up catching wind of your giving, all that, that really should do is it should encourage, it should motivate, it should elevate our Savior. It should just glorify Him. It should talk about faithful stewardship. That's it. It's not about our glory. It should all be about exalting our Heavenly Father for His glory alone. Right. Let's bring this into the stage. Evaluation time. I'm going to ask a few questions. Do you first and foremost recognize what God's given you? Have you ever really stopped and thought about that for a minute? What God has blessed you with. I mean, simply salvation alone is way more than any of us ever deserve. Do you recognize what God has given you? Secondly, in reciprocation, are we giving back to God? That is something that is expected. This text makes it very clear it's supposed to be an ongoing process. If it isn't, why is it? Is it a reciprocation? Is it from a heart that wants to glorify God? And the last question, is our giving to God a priority or is it an afterthought? I think sometimes it can easily shift to the latter where it becomes, oh yeah, I forgot about this. God wants the first and the best what he doesn't want scraps. But he's also not going to make you. He is going to humbly allow you to make those choices. We should give out of the abundance of our hearts. We should give graciously. Give happily. Give with a smile in our hearts. God loves a cheerful giver. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7, it says, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I think the phrase that rattles in my head, it's not about obligation. It's about invitation. And I think that really echoes in a lot of my interactions with people. I can try to make something about an obligation. Well, you're a child of God. You should. No. That's not what God wants. Because that's not what God does. God, He invites us. Our God invites us to give. Our God invites us to be a part of what He is doing. He is the one who invites us to take the resources that He has already entrusted to us to use for His glory and honor. That's fantastic. Now, I do want to put one more kind of bullet point on this. If you're anything like me, you might be sitting there and being like, okay, it is way easier for me to give than receive. I'm one of those people. I would rather give you something of mine until it hurts than have you give me something. And as I prepared this, the Lord did a great work in my heart. He's very good at that. 
It was very humbling. That's pride. Bold-faced pride on my part. That I would somehow think that I don't need others. You know that God sometimes allows us to go through things simply for the purpose of other people being a blessing to us. It is good for that person, and it is needful for us. God wants to use people in your life. Do not hinder them from being a blessing. Allow that to happen. Receive it with gratitude. Don't rob someone else of being a blessing. Again, it is good for both of you. So as we close today, let me ask one final question. It is a question that really gets right to the heart of the matter. What does my giving believe? Let's go to the Lord. Lord, I thank you for your ultimate gift, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the once for all, all-sufficient gift who was willing to lay his life down for our behalf. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without that gift, we're hopeless. But Lord, because of that gift, there is so many blessings that you have afforded to us, and they are honestly more than I can begin to count. You have lavished them. And Lord, as I start to recognize that, of what you've really blessed me with, Lord, help me not to be stingy. Help me not to get in the way of what you want to do. Lord, allow me to give freely when it comes to my resources. But again, a lot of times we think about this as just a financial thing. <laughs> and please, that is not, that is not, not, what this whole thing is about. Lord, a lot of times we are reluctant for some reason not to just give you complete control and surrender. Lord, we want to hold on to things. We want to have some modicum of control or at least perceived control. And I really think it shows itself a lot when it comes to our wallets. And so God, we surrender those. Lord, we surrender our gifts Lord, it is for the edification of the body why you have given those. It's not for our own personal benefit. Lord, it is for everyone else's good why you have equipped us in such a way. Lord, we need each other. The body is not functioning if one gift is off in a way or one gift isn't working. Lord, we need everyone for your glory and honor. And it is a healthy church. Well, that's what we want. We want a church that is, that, that is used by you for your glory and honor. Well, that's our desire because we have come in contact with what you have done on our individual accounts. And we are so grateful for that. And with gratitude, Lord, our hearts come before you in thanks and in praise. And this is just one avenue of worship Lord, you've covered this one. You're going to go in depth on prayer. And Lord, you also cover fasting. These three things were something that were so um, very, in, 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 uh, very much a displayed factor when it comes to the Jewish people. But Lord, it's more than an outlaw. You are interested in the hearts. Let us evaluate those and surrender our hearts to you that you would be the one who gets the glory. And we thank you for it, and we praise in your precious name.